Heather, welcome to this CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We have a returning CUBE alumni, Ramesh Prabhagaran, who's the co-founder and CEO of Promisio. Great to see you, Ramesh. Thanks for coming in Thank to our studio. And thanks for the new layout. Thanks for having me here, uh, John. After a, a series of Zoom conversations, <laughs> it's great to be live and in the flesh. Great to be in person. We obviously got a new stage for our SuperCloud event, which we've been opening up to the community. Looking forward to getting your perspective uh, on that soon uh, as well. Uh, but I want to, this CUBE conversation is really about you guys. I want to get the story down. You guys came out of stealth. Um, Multi-cloud, super cloud is right in your wheelhouse. Exactly. You got to love That's the right. super cloud. Yeah, as I walked in, I saw super cloud all over the place and I, it just <laughs> gives you a jolt of energy. So. Well, you guys are in the middle of the action. You're, 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 you're a company, and I want you to explain this in a minute, is in the middle of this next wave because we had this structural change I call it cloud one. Uh, Amazon use case, developers you know, need to build a data center, all that goodness happens, higher level services and abstractions are happening, and then Azure comes in more, more PaaS and then more install base, now they're nipping at the heels, so full on hyperscale, Absolutely. CapEx growth, great for everybody. Now comes new use cases. Correct. Cloud to cloud, app to app, data, you see Databricks, Snowflake, MongoDB, yep. all doing extremely well by leveraging the CapEx, now it's an ops problem. Exactly. Now ops and security. Yeah, it's, it's speed of uh, speed of applications. How are you guys vectoring into that? Explain what you guys do. Uh, absolutely, so let me, let me take kind of the customer pain point first, right? Because it's always easier to explain that and then we explain kind of what is it that we do. So uh, it's no surprise, uh, applications are moving into the cloud or people are building apps in the cloud in, in masses. Um, the infrastructure that's sitting in front of these applications, cutting across networking, security, the operational piece associated with that, does not move at the same speed. Right? Uh, the apps sometimes get upgraded two, three times a day. The infrastructure gets touched one time a week, right? at best. Uh, and so increasingly, the cloud platform teams, the, the developers are all like, hey, why, why, why? Right? And so I, I thought things were supposed to move fast in the cloud. It doesn't. Now, if you double click on that, really, it's two reasons. One. Um, the, those that want to have consistency across the stack that they had in the data center, they bring a virtual form factor of that stack and line it up in the cloud, <laughs> and before you know it, it's <laughs> cost, it's operational complexity, there are multiple single panes of glass, all, all the fun stuff well, associated with that. Just to, just to interject that. real quick, it is fast in the cloud if you're a developer. Exactly. So it's kind of like hurry up, slow down, wait. Correct. Right, so the developers are shifting left, open source is booming, yep. things are fine for developers right now. If you're a developer, things are good. But the guy sitting it's, in front of that. It's the ops guy. <laughs> exactly. They got to deal with things like lock-in, choice, security. Exactly, These things and are those, are, those are really the, the, the key challenges, right? And so we've seen some that actually said, hey, you know what, I don't want to bring my data center stack into the cloud. Let me go cloud native, right? And they start to build it up. <clears throat> 14 services from AWS, 15 from Azure, 14 more from GCP, even if you're in a single cloud, let's just keep it to that, right? I need to know how to put this together, right? So because all these services are great, but how do I put this together? And enterprises don't have just one application, they have hundreds of these applications. So the requirements of a database is different than a service mesh, different than a serverless application, different than a web application. <laughs> and before you know it, like how do I put all these things together, right? And so we, we looked at this problem and we said, okay, we subscribe to the fact that cloud native is the way to go, right? But something needs to be there to make this simple, right? And so first thing that we did was bring all these cloud native services together. We helped orchestrate that and we said, okay, you know what, Mr. Mr. Enterprise, we got you covered, right? But now it doesn't stop there. That's like 10% of the value, right? What do you really need? What do you care about now? Because the apps are in the center of the universe and who's talking to it? It's another application sitting either in the same cloud or in a different cloud, or it's a user connecting into the application. So now let's talk about what are the networking, security, operational requirements required for these apps to talk to each other or the user to talk to the application. That's really what we, what we focus on. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's driving this opportunity for you, and I want to get your reaction to this, is that the modern application movement is all about cloud native. Okay, developers are doing great. Now the, the kind of the kumbaya moment in enterprises is that the security team and de ops teams have to play ball and yep. be friends with the developer. Exactly. And vice versa. So harmony's coming there, so a little harmony. And two, the business is driving it. Absolutely. IT is transforming over. That's why the super cloud idea is interesting to Dave and I because when we coined that term, it was, multi-cloud was not a market. Correct. Everyone has multiple clouds because they have Microsoft Office that's now in the cloud, they got SQL Server. I mean, it's really kind of like kind of Microsoft Yeah, that's cloud. just, exactly. So you have a cloud. So, but do you have ops teams Correct. building on the stack? What about the network layer? Exactly. This is where the, the rubber meets the road. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and if you look at the, the challenges there, 
um, just if you just focus on just networking and, and security, right? Uh, when applications need to talk to e each other, y you, you have a whole bunch of underlying services, but somebody needs to put this thing on top because what you care about is can these group of users talk to these class of applications? Uh, or these group of uh, applications, can they talk to e each other, right? This whole notion of connectivity is, is just table stakes. Everybody just assumes it, it's there, right? It's the next layer up, right, which is, how do I bring zero trust access? How do I get the observability? And observability is not just a bunch of pretty donut charts, right? I've had people look, look to me in my previous company, uh, the, the startup, and said, okay, you give me all these nice donut charts, but so what? What do you want me to do with this, right? And so you have to translate that into real actions, right? How do I bring zero trust capabilities? How do I bring the observability capabilities? How do I understand cloud native networking and bring those things together so that you can help solve for the problem? It's interesting, one of the questions I had here to ask you was what does it mean to be cloud native and why now? And you brought up zero trust, trust and verify. These are security yep. concepts. But if, if you look at what's going on at KubeCon and CNCF and, and Linux Foundation, uh, software supply chain's a huge issue where trust is the issue. They want trust there, so you get zero trust yep. here. What is it, zero trust or trust? I mean, what's there? No, I think- Is one hardware-based, perimeter, networking, that kind of perimeter's no, dead? The, the, kind of the whole concept trust of- Zero trust. The, the whole concept of, of zero trust is like, don't trust what is underlying, just trust what you're talking to, right? Like, so if you and I talking to each other, John, you need to trust me, I need to trust you, and, and we are able to have the conversation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? But in the application world, if you talk about two apps that are talking to each other, let's say there is a, a web application in one AWS region talking to a database in a, in a different uh, region, right? Now, do you want to make sure that you are able to build that trust all the way from the application to the application, or do you want to move the trust boundary to the two entities that are talking to each other so that irrespective of what they go on underneath the covers, you can be always sure that these two things are, are trusted, right? So, so uh, Ramesh, I was on LinkedIn yesterday, I wrote a comment, Dave Vellante wrote a post on super clouds, that we're, we're talking about it, and I wrote, Clouds cloud as a commodity, question and then a bunch of other stuff that we're going to talk about. And Keith Townsend jumped on that and got on Twitter, put a poll, <laughs> is cloud commodity sourced me? I'm like, so it started a big thread. And it was interesting, the reaction was interesting. And my point was to be provocative on, on cloud isn't commodity, but there's commodity elements. Correct. EC2 and S3, you can look at that and say, that's commodity I as. But Amazon Web Services has done an amazing job for higher level services. Correct, absolutely. Okay, so how does that translate into the use cases that you see that you guys are going after and solving? Because it's the same kind of concept. IaaS and SaaS have to work together to solve problems. Absolutely. But that's in an integrated environment, say native, in a native cloud. Exactly. Like and, 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 how does that work across clouds? Yeah, no, you, you bring up a great point, uh, John. So uh, when, when, let's take the simple use case, right? Let's keep the, the user to app thing to the side. Let's just say two apps need to talk to each other, right? There are multiple ways in which you can solve this problem, right? You can build highways. That's what our customers call. I'll build highways. I don't care what goes on those highways. I'll just build highways. You bring any kind of application <laughs> workload on it. I just make sure that the highways are good, right? <laughs> It's kind of the lowest common denominator. It's the path to lease assistance. You, you can get stuff done, yeah. but it's not going to move the needle, right? And then you have really modern kind of service networking where, okay, I'm, I'm looking at like every single HTTP, API, endpoint, whatnot, and I'm like optimizing for that, right? Great if you know what you're doing, but like if you have thousands of these applications, it's not going to be really feasible yeah. to do that. Right? And so what we have seen customers do is actually is, is employ a mixed approach, right? Where they say, I'm going to build these highways, the highways are going to make sure that I can go from one place to another, uh, and maybe within regions, across clouds, whatnot. But then I have specific requirements that my business needs that actually needs tweaking, right? And so I'm going to tweak those things. So that's why what we call as like full stack transit is exactly that, right? Which is I'll build you the the uh, the guts of it so that hey, you know what? If somebody screams at you, hey, why is my application not accessible? You don't have that problem. It is always accessible, yeah. right? But then the requirements for performance, the requirements for zero trust, the requirements for segmentation, and all of that are things you can That's a hard problem. Cover. That's a hard problem to solve. And, and you guys are solving that? Absolutely, exactly. So, right. uh, yeah. so let me throw this at you. So, so, okay, I get that. And by the way, that's exactly what we're seeing. Dave and I were also talking and debating about multi-cloud as what it is. Now, the, the Nirvana definition was, I have a workload that's going to work the same, and just magically just shift to Azure. <laughs> like, because there's better resources. There's no magic there. <laughs> um, so, but this brings up the point of, of operations. Now, data, data um, Bricks and Snowflake, they're building their software to run on multi-cloud yep. seamlessly. Exactly. And they can do that, that's their application. Correct. What is the multi-cloud use case to be, that's the super cloud use case in your mind, because right now it's not yet there. Correct. What is the super cloud use case that's going to allow this seamless management or workloads? What's yeah, your view? So, so, so if, you, if you take 
enterprise, right? Large enterprise in, in particular, um, they invariably have some workloads that are uh, on, let's say, if, if the primary cloud is AWS, there are some workloads in, in Azure, maybe they've acquired a new company, maybe a startup that uses GCP, mm. whatnot. So they have sprinkles of workloads in other clouds yeah. as well, right? So that's like that's the, the breed kind of thing. That's the, yeah, exactly. That's, that's not what causes anybody to wake up in the morning and say, I need to have a, a super cloud strategy. That's, that's, that's not the thing, right? But now increasingly you're seeing, pick the right cloud for the appropriate workload, right? that is going to change quite a bit because I have my infrastructure heavy workloads in AWS. I have quite a bit of like analytics and, and mining type of applications that are better on, on, on GCP. I have uh, all of my packaged applications work well on Azure, right? How do I make sure all of this? And it's not just apps of this kind, mm -hmm. like even simple things like VDI. VDI always used to be, I have this instance I run up and, and whatnot. Now every single cloud provider is giving you their own flavor of, uh, of virtual desktop. Yeah. And so how do you make sure all, all of these things uh, work, work, work together, right? And, um, once again, you, you, what we have seen customers do is, hey, they settle on one cloud as their primary, uh, but then you always have sprinkles of workloads across all other clouds. Now, you could also go down the path, and we are increasingly seeing this, you could go down the path of, hey, I'm using cloud as backbone, right? Uh, cloud providers have invested massive amounts of dollars to make sure that the infrastructure reaches there. Literally almost to the extent that every user in a metro city is 10 milliseconds from the public cloud, right? And so they've, they've allowed for that. Now you can actually use cloud backbones to get the availability, reliability, and, and, and whatnot, right? So these are some new use cases that we have seen actually brew up in, in customers. I was just doing an interview and, and the topic was the innovator's dilemma. And one of the panelists said, it's not the innovator's dilemma, it's the integration, the <laughs> integrator dilemma. Because if you have commodity and you have choices on say backbones and, and whatnot for transit, the integration is the key glue now. Yep. What's your reaction to that? Abs absolutely, no, no and we have, we have seen, we used to spend quite a bit of time in kind of what is the day zero problem, right? right? How do I put this together? Um, conversations are moved past that because there are multiple ways in which you can do that mm -hmm. right now, right? The conversations are moved into kind of, this is more of an operational problem for me. It's not just operations in the in form of, hey, I need to find out where the problem is, troubleshoot and, and mm -hmm. so forth, but I need to make like really high quality decisions. And those decisions are going to be guided by data. We have uh, enterprise customers that uh, acquire new companies or uh, they, they have a, a new site that they open up. Let's say uh, it's a it's a New York based a company. Yeah, exactly. It's a New York based company, and they acquire uh, a, a team out in Sydney, Australia. Right? Does your cloud tell you today that you have new users or new applications that are in Sydney and naturally just extend? No, it doesn't. Somebody has to look at the macro problem look at where are all my workloads, yeah. do a bunch of engineering in order to make that work, right? We, we took it upon ourselves to say, hey, you know what, 24 hours later, you're going to get a recommendation in the platform yeah. that says, okay, you have new set of applications or new set of users coming from Sydney, Australia, yeah. what have you done about it? Click a button and then you yeah. expand on it's it. It's kind of like how IT became the uh, easy way to run a, uh, the data center. Exactly. Before IT, you had to be a PhD <laughs> and roll out. I mean, you know how it yeah. was, right? So, so you're kind of taking that same approach. Okay, well, let, Ramesh, great stuff. I want to do a follow-up certainly with you on this because you're in the middle of where this wave is going, the structural change, and certainly you can participate in that super cloud conversation. Um, but for your company, what's going on there? Give us an update, customer activity, what's it like? You guys came out of stealth. What's been the reaction? Uh, give a plug for the company, you're looking to hire. Take a minute to. Oh, wonderful! Plug no, in. thank you. So, um, primary uh, use cases are really around cloud networking, right? How do you go within the cloud and across clouds and to the cloud, right? So, those are really the, the key use cases. Um, we go after large enterprises predominantly, but any kind of mid enterprise that is extremely cloud oriented uh, has a lot of workloads in the cloud, equally applicable applicable there. So, we have. Uh, about 60 of the Fortune 500s that we are engaged in right now, right? Many of them are paying customers as well. And we- How are they buying service? Is it- is Yeah, so we, we provide hardware? software. We provide software that actually sits inside the customer's own administrative control, delivered as a service that they can use to go so to- So on-premise hosting or in cloud? No, it's entirely in the cloud, okay, delivered as a service. Uh, so they need to, need to take care of the maintenance and, and whatnot, uh, but they just consume it uh, uh, from, from the cloud directly, right? Um, and so uh, where we are right now is, is essentially uh, have a bunch of repeatable use cases that many customers are, are employing us for. So again, building highways, many different ways to build highways, mm -hmm. at the same time take care of the segmentation, micro segmentation requirements, and then importantly this whole net DevOps, right? This whole net DevOps is a, is a, is a cultural shift that we have seen. So if you are a network engineer 
there, Net DevOps seems like it's a foreign term, right? But if you are an operational engineer, then Net DevOps, you know exactly exactly what to do. So bringing all those principles together, making sure that the networking teams are empowered to essentially embrace the cloud the right way, right? The, the, the single biggest thing that we have done, I would say done well, is we've built very well on top of the cloud provider. So we don't go against cloud native services. They've done that really, really well, mm -hmm. right? It makes no sense to go say, I have a better transit gateway than you. No, hands down, an AWS transit gateway or an Azure VWAN and whatnot are some of the best services that they have provided. But how does what does that mean? How, how do you make sure that- you software into it. Exactly, right? And so how can you build a layer of software on top so that when you attach that into the applications, right? that you can actually get the experience required, you can get the security requirements and, and so forth. So th that's kind of where, where we are. We're also humbled by essentially some of the, the mega partners uh, mm -hmm. that have taken a bet on us, sometimes to the extent <laughs> that it's, we are, we're a 70 person <laughs> company and the, some of the partners that we are talking to actually are quite humbling, right? And so- <laughs> They have uh, a lot more resource. Made, exactly, yeah. And how so, many rounds of financing have you done? So we have done uh, two rounds of financing. We've raised about 55 million uh, in, in capital. Uh, again, really uh, great set of uh, investors backing us up and a uh, strong sense of uh, conviction on kind of where, where we are going. Do you and, think you're uh, early or not? Because that's always probably the <laughs> biggest scary. I can see this It one. depends. Is that what keeps you up at night? So, yeah, exactly. So the, I, I go through these phases uh, yeah. uh, internally in my head, right? Like the vision's win, right on the money, exactly. no doubt about it. So when you win an opportunity, and we have like a, a few dozen of these, right? When you win an opportunity, you're like, yes, absolutely, this is where it is, right? And you go for a week and you don't win something, you're like, hey man, why, why are we not seeing this, right? And so you go through these yeah. cycles, but I'll tell you with conviction, the, the fact yeah. that customers are moving workloads into the public cloud, not, not in dozens, but in like the hundreds and the, and, yeah. and, and the thousands is essentially means that they need something like this. Right? And the cloud native wave is driving and big time Exactly, change. right? And so when, when the customer has a conversation with AWS Azure GCP and they are privy to all these services and we go in after that and talk about how do I put this together and he, help you focus on your outcomes, that materially yeah. moves the most. It's the a day zero opportunity. Exactly, and then correct. You got headroom beyond that. Exactly, so that's the that's the positive side of it, right? And, and enterprises certainly are sometimes a little cautious about when they adopt new technologies and, and, and so forth. So it's a natural cycle. Fortunately, again, we are humbled by the fact that we have a few dozen of the pioneering customers that are using our platform. That proves, that gives you the legitimacy yeah. for a startup, right? You Not got great, you got great pedigree on clients. Real quick, final question, uh, 30 seconds. What's the pain point for people watching? When do they call you in? What's their environment look like? What are some of the things that, that, that give the signals that you guys got to get the call. If you have more than, let's say, five or 10 VPCs in the cloud and you have not invested in building a networking platform that gives you the connectivity, the security, the observability, and the performance requirements, you absolutely have to do that right. Because we have seen many, many customers, it goes from five to 50 to 100 within a week. Yeah. And so you don't want to be caught essentially in the midst of that. So that's- One more final, final question. Since you're a scenes as an entrepreneur, you've been there, done that previous times. Yeah, what is this, scars. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> We've all got scar tissue. We've been doing the queue for 12 years. We've seen a lot of stuff. What has been, what's the difference now in this market that's, that's different than before? What's exciting you? What's the big change? What's, in your opinion, happening now that's really important that people should pay attention to? Absolutely. A, a lot of it is driven by one, the, the focus on, on the cloud itself, right? Uh, that's driving a sense of speed uh, like never before. Uh, because in the infrastructure world, yeah, you do it today, or you do it six months from now, you had, you had some leeway. Here, networking security teams are being yelled at almost every single day by the cloud guys saying, you guys are not moving fast enough, fast enough, fast yeah. enough. So, uh, so that thing is different. So it, it helps kind of shrink the sales cycle for us. So the second big one is nobody knows essentially the new set of use cases that are coming about. We are seeing patterns emerge in terms of yeah. new use cases almost every single day. Some, some, some days it's like completely on the other end of the spectrum, like I, I'm only serverless and, and service mesh. <laughs> on the other end it's like I have a package application I'm moving into the cloud, right? And so we're learning a lot as well. Yeah. Um, also- And great time for super cloud. Exactly, that's right. Do the cloud really well, make it super, bring it to other yep. use cases, stitch it all together, make it easy to use. Exactly. 
right. reduce the complexity. It's just evolution. Yeah. And our, our goal is essentially uh, enterprise customers should not be focused so much on building infrastructure this way, right? They should focus on users, application services. Let vendors like us like worry about the uh, the nitty gritty underneath. Ramesh, thank you for this conversation. Absolutely, this great cube conversation in the middle of all the action. Super cloud, multi cloud. The future is going to be very much cloud based. IaaS, SaaS, connecting environments. Uh, this is the cloud 2.0, super clouds. And this is what people are going to be working on. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.